This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Science tells us that the universe is almost 14 billion years old, yet will live many trillions of years more before the last stars die out. But that is a future that will never happen. So today we return to the Civilizations at the End of Time series after a year long hiatus. Today we'll be exploring what civilizations might do as their own suns begin to burn out, and what options they have on the table to extend their existence after that. We'll also be discussing the supernova engine, one of the most extreme forms of stellar engineering allowed under known physics. I should also warn viewers that while the Civilizations at the End of Time series is, weirdly, our most watched series, its episodes are always composed of concepts we've developed in more detail in other episodes. They're not really meant to be standalone episodes, and I'll reference some relevant episodes which you might want to consult, so that when I start talking about moving stars for instance, you already know and understand the physics involved in that. This month we're also celebrating Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Unsurprisingly the second book of that series, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, is our focus for today. Speaking of restaurants and food, we've a lot of concepts to cover so grabbing a drink and a snack for today's show is definitely a good idea. In The Hitchhiker's Guide we have the restaurant at the end of the universe and also the Big Bang Burger Shack as both are events that any civilization with time travel would certainly want to see. But while we know when the Big Bang happened, as it was a fairly singular event, the end of the universe is a much hazier concept. The distant future of the universe is not something we can speak of with much certainty just yet. At the moment, the weight of evidence tilts toward an eternal expansion. Dark energy will expand space so that all but our nearest neighboring galaxies are so far apart that they will fly over the cosmological event horizon, gone forever. At the same time our galaxy and those neighbors will merge together into one big clump. This is not a very distant future on the epic timescales of this channel either. That galactic merger isn't a few billion years from now, but something that's already happening. Our galaxy and a couple of our bigger neighbors like Andromeda and Triangulum have been eating smaller neighbor galaxies for a long time and will merge with each other in just a few billion years. During that same time, we will have noticed a lot of the more distant galaxies we can presently barely see will have disappeared, even though we'll be able to see further because space is expanding everywhere constantly and the greater the distance from us, the greater the rate of expansion. At far enough distances, that expansion will happen faster than light can cover the new distance. In a hundred billion years or so, only those galaxies just outside our local group will still be visible to us, and soon they'll fade away too. But our future merged galaxy will still be running strong at that point, and star formation will be slowing a little bit but not by too much. Our sun will be long dead by then, but our nearest neighbor, Proxima Centauri, will still be young in its own much longer life. But eventually it will die too. New stars will form less and less often, until sometime many trillions of years from now all that will be left is a lot of cooling stellar remnants. Since stars are critical to life, we might think that the death of that last star is the effective end of the universe. All that will remain will be a slowly expanding and cooling universe of eternal darkness. This is called the heat death because even though it will be quite cold, in physics we define heat as the entropic state of energy rather than a specific temperature. There are some alternative cosmologies for the fate of the universe that are quite hot though, such as the Big Crunch, essentially a reversed Big Bang, and perhaps also something called the Big Rip in which expansion continues to accelerate until it tears apart even atoms themselves. As of now, heat death is the most agreed upon theory, all stars will eventually die. While you might think that the last one's death will signal the end of time in a meaningful sense, as we saw in black hole farming and ion stars, this is not so. Civilization can continue past that point, and possibly even thrive. 
More to the point, this death will not be some spectacular explosion, just a slow toning down of the lights. The longest lived stars are the least massive ones, and as available hydrogen gets scarcer in those final days, these smaller stars will tend to be the ones forming. Indeed tiny dim red dwarfs will eventually become the only stars in existence, since they persist for a very long time and will make up an increasing percentage of new stars near the end of things. And they don't explode. In fact very few stars do, just the most massive ones. Big stars run out of fuel and they enter a red giant phase, but the very smallest do not even do that. They will probably get hotter, turning into blue dwarfs. These stars take a very long time to evolve, and the Universe isn't old enough to have any yet. Eventually, in their final death throes, they will flash into white dwarf stars. Finally, at the end of their lives, they will cool into black dwarfs. The end of the Universe will not be marked by a discrete moment in time, nor is the death of most stars. The biggest stars, and the tiniest fraction of them, will undergo a red giant expansion and a supernova, with the most massive of these turning into black holes and the smaller ones into neutron stars. We've often discussed ways to live around black holes, and neutron stars also slowly cool, indeed what we call a pulsar is merely a relatively young neutron star that's still rather hot and active and happens to be tipped at an angle we can observe the pulsar beam from. Far more stars, including our own Sun, will expand as a red giant, then lose those outer layers and fall into a white dwarf that slowly cools off, and even more of them, especially as the Universe ages, will skip the red giant phase in favor of being a blue dwarf. We'll discuss stellar engineering options in a bit, But let's start by discussing the slow cooling off of white dwarfs, neutron stars, and indeed black holes. We'll focus on our own Sun as our first example. Right now it's about halfway through its lifetime on the main sequence, burning hydrogen to produce helium and light. The term main sequence implies it is the longest chunk of its life, but this tends to falsely imply a fairly static and long period followed by something short and violent and final. Quite to the contrary, our Sun is slowly warming up with time, it will be about 10% brighter in a billion years, and life on Earth will begin to die as the atmosphere and oceans are stripped away. About 5 billion years from now, when our galaxies have essentially all merged or are just finishing that up, the Sun will exhaust the hydrogen in its core and will expand into a subgiant and then a red giant. It will proceed through the various phases of that process for hundreds of millions of years, blowing off matter in a planetary nebula before leaving an exposed naked core that's about 100,000 Kelvin. Finally, it will become a white dwarf. Bigger stars will evolve into more energetic white dwarf remnants and will take longer to cool down. But here's a critical concept. Light is radiated off into space as a function of surface area and the fourth power of temperature. The more they cool, the longer it takes to drop one more degree. A carbon white dwarf of 0.6 solar masses, what our Sun will likely end as, would take a billion and a half years to cool down to be merely as hot as our Sun's current surface temperature. It would then take another billion and a half years to cool another thousand Kelvin, and the coldest white dwarf we found thus far, a bit under 4,000 Kelvin, warmer than many red dwarfs, are over 10 billion years old. So the white dwarf phase of our Sun, where it is still giving off a significant amount of visible light, is going to last much longer than its actual main sequence as it slowly cools and shrinks its habitable zone and shifts to a shade of white light more akin to incandescent bulbs or candles than what we think of as vivid sunlight. This, incidentally, is not when it becomes a black dwarf, a source of some confusion about timelines involved as you often hear how it takes trillions of years. As mentioned, it takes longer and longer to cool each increment and in astronomical terms we don't really care about visible light, so Black Dwarf is a fairly ambiguous term, sometimes given as when it would cool to the temperature of the cosmic microwave background radiation, 
which is about 2.7 Kelvin, and actually gets Lowell all the time. So defining a black dwarf this way is a bit of a moving goalpost, and which each progressive step takes longer and longer. Neutron stars, which are much hotter and far denser, should take even longer to cool down, whereas white dwarfs can only cool by photon cooling from their surface, which stays a lot colder than their core, neutron stars can cool by neutrino emission and so cool quite rapidly initially. However, they cool much more slowly than white dwarfs over the long run, and may prove useful for maintaining a civilization long after the Stalliferous Era. Let's consider our sun though, or a parallel one, once it has become a white dwarf and cooled to about our sun's temperature, around 10 billion years from now, and some billions of years after all the debris has been cleared away or coalesced into planets again. Where is the habitable zone? As mentioned, this will constantly be contracting, but don't overly focus on that, I mean it's constantly expanding right now and civilizations shouldn't just throw their hands up in despair because a billion years from now they need to move their planet to avoid being frozen or scorched, considering we generally rearrange our civilizations on timelines of decades or centuries, not billions of years. It's as hot as our sun, but only Earth-sized and extraordinarily dense, and it's producing only about a ten-thousandth of its current light, or 1% of 1%, which means its habitable zone, going with the inverse square of distance, is only a hundredth 1% of what it is now, about four times further from this new Earth-sized sun than the Moon is from Earth. Amusingly, it is going to appear about the same size and color in the sky of a planet orbiting at that distance as it does to Earth now. There's an issue with gravity in this scenario, but we'll get to that. I'd like to emphasize that right now, the Sun is slowly warming up, and we'll need to eventually move the Earth away to avoid baking it. We'll have a problem during the Red Giant phase where we need to move it quite far away for several hundred million years, but we will then be able to bring it back in again toward the Sun and slowly tap its orbital potential energy as it spirals inward as it needs to be closer to the cooling white dwarf over many billions of years. This post-Red Giant phase of Earth's existence will not be some brief last gasp epoch of life, it's one as long as what we've already had. But it will not be quite the same though. For instance, the Sun will lose almost half its mass during that red giant phase, and the orbital period at just .01 AU for half a solar mass is only half a day. That's a very short year, let alone day, but don't despair, you could set the planet's rotational speed backwards so that the Sun still rose every 24 hours. One of those tricks we discussed for sun moons around artificial planets in making suns a couple months back. It takes some effort to spin a planet backwards and keep it that way, but we're already talking about moving planets at this point and those are both child's play compared to what we'll get to momentarily. We'll talk more about how to actually move planets next week in Planet Ships. Another issue though is that while it's only planet-sized and reduced in mass, it's not that much reduced in mass. If you're orbiting it just four times further away than the Moon is from Earth, about 1.5 million kilometers, that white dwarf of about half the Sun's mass is actually going to be exerting more force on the surface of that planet than that planet's gravity does and indeed it won't be able to exist as a result, as that's inside the Roche limit. So we'll need to consider some variations on this plan to make the general idea workable. Now when the White Dwarf is still warmer and brighter, a planet farther out can do okay, and if it's a little too cold it could be warmed by meals concentrating the light. You could build a big lens at the Lagrange point of the planet and its white dwarf sun and keep it nice and warm the whole time, just expanding that lens as the star cooled. Additionally, you could cheat by building a mega planet too, which we've talked about before in the episode Mega Earths, and if there's one thing you're not short of in an older universe, it's dense materials like iron for building dense planetary cores. 
Several billion years is a lot of time for gradual adaptation to higher gravity too, so you could get away with building some giant iron ball far more massive than Earth as your new planet. There are also ways to counter stellar tidal forces exerting crazy effects on our artificial planet's topology, which we'll discuss another time. Unfortunately, this all suggests that just dropping Earth around a future white dwarf sun is not a great option. Our more classic Dyson Swarm approach would still work just fine, and using mirrors to concentrate light to warm those habitats is less of a big deal since the sunlight is already a bit unnatural looking in the first place, see Environment of Space Habitats for details. However, if you built a big hollow sphere around our own present day Sun, out at the distance that would have normal Earth gravity on it, it would be 574 times wider than Earth's diameter, with 330,000 times more surface area. This sphere around a reduced white dwarf with half the Sun's mass would be 400 times wider than Earth's diameter and 165,000 times more spacious. You could essentially use that white dwarf to provide your gravity to a massive shell world and help keep it warm, without needing to worry about close-in tidal forces. Of course providing light is a little trickier as we've discussed before. However, you would have a terrible gravity issue if you tried to build a civilization directly on a cooled down, room temperature white dwarf, which for the moment I will call a grey dwarf as I don't think that term has been used for anything outside Dungeons and Dragons. The temperature on a Grey Dwarf is perfect, and it will stay that way for a very, very long time, but since it's ultra-compressed, degenerate matter we're talking about, not only do you need a protective shell between you and it, you're also talking about a surface gravity of many thousands of times what Earth has. Now if you're living on a shell around a cooling white dwarf, you can keep contracting that as it cools toward this grey dwarf state, until you reach a point where the gravity is too much for normal life. An inorganic civilization though might be able to handle a very high gravity, especially a purely digital one like those we focused on in black hole farming and iron stars. Such a grey dwarf civilization is no longer biological and constrained to that specific room temperature environment so they can ride that grey dwarf as their heat engine all the way down to black dwarf status quadrillions of years later, taking advantage of the massive computational bonuses of an ultra-cold universe as they do. Remember the universe is getting colder as time goes on as well, and as long as something is warmer than the environment around it, it can be used to generate power. By the land hour limit on classic computation, the processing power per joule of energy used is inversely proportional to temperature, so these artificial beings will enjoy a very long and prosperous existence on that grey dwarf. Similarly, we probably shouldn't rule out the option of turning the degenerate star into an actual computer, some hypothetical computronium, which has been suggested as an option for neutron stars such as the Hades Matrix in Alistair Reynolds' novel Revelation Space. The big advantage of this, if you can pull it off, is that it's literally the densest computer with the minimum signal lag between components that you can make, only slightly less dense than a black hole. For that matter, Robert L. Forward's classic novel Dragon's Egg actually has life evolving on a neutron star, with neutron starquakes endangering civilization. For these beings time proceeds very rapidly as they exist on the microscopic scale, improbable but an interesting approach to alternative chemistries for life, and we might be able to do strange things like entangle entire stars to create oversized quantum computers too, one day. It is worth noting though that all that lost mass during the Red Giant phase is mostly unused hydrogen and you could take most of that and make a very nice new sun, a fully convective red dwarf with a multi-trillion year life that closely orbited that white dwarf as a binary. That's one possible way of doing urban renewal on a recently dead star system ending its red giant phase by sweeping up all that excess hydrogen to make a binary partner for the white dwarf. Indeed this is how we get one of our major types of supernovae. Type 1a. 
When a bunch of hydrogen accumulates on a white dwarf, usually robbed from a close binary sibling, it will erupt as a giant explosion. I should also note here that there is such a thing as a regular Ord Nova, the smaller cousin of the better known Supernova, and they're very common but don't get much attention these days. Same basic process, just milder. A little bit of matter leaks onto a white dwarf, fuses, and releases a modest explosion. We get about 50 of these a year in the Milky Way. But as long as you're doing it carefully, you can keep feeding a little more matter to a white dwarf in a stable process of fusion. I dislike this approach compared to the normal star lifetime extension method we discuss here, star lifting out heavy elements and adding more fresh hydrogen as needed, but it is one way to rekindle a star that's already dead, and since the light produced is soft x-rays, not something we want to get a tan with, it works well with an external shellboard approach where it's just being used for power, not direct sunlight. Of course we're not necessarily uninterested in making things blow up. The problem with almost every stellar engine we discuss here is they only produce a lot of power in a relative sense. A star is immensely more powerful than our mundane power sources, but it's still a trickle supply, taking billions of years to go through its fuel. Sometimes you might want a lot of energy very fast. We have previously discussed megastructures that make even a Dyson Swarm look tiny, like the Birch Planet from Mega Earths or the Compressed Galaxy which is a swarm of stars like a giant Dyson Swarm that we envisioned at the end of the episode Making Suns. But when we talk about moving stars via shikata thrusters or even whole galaxies, we're talking about a dreadfully slow process because as powerful as those stars are, they are also ultra-massive. So sometimes we might want to go the larger nova route of white dwarfs, or even the Type 1a supernova route, to get vast amounts of energy quickly, if for instance we wanted to move a star faster. For that matter, this trick works on neutron stars too, which we haven't mentioned a use for yet. When a supernova explodes, the energy output tends to parallel what a star like our own will release during its whole multi-billion year life. It might seem like far too much energy to ever want to capture at once, but maybe it's not. We often talk about fusion, a technology that often gets labeled as the energy source of the future, and always will be, but actually we've been able to do fusion for a long time. People just aren't too keen on detonating hydrogen bombs in massive underground vats of molten salt. We've also discussed using pulsed nukes to drive ships, as in the Orion or Daedalus projects. A supernova is just a pulsed fusion reactor on a grand scale, and they do not release all their energy in a single instant, and they range in power, generally about 10 to the 44 joules, peak luminosity is usually around 10 to the 38 watts a bit under a trillion times that of our Sun. So a classic Dyson shell running on something like that would need to be about a million AU, about 16 light years, in radius. It sounds really big, but we can produce much smaller novae, and more to the point, if you're constantly detonating them in the same place, you are going to have a lot of gas kicking around, absorbing light and slowly releasing it, so you could go a lot smaller and note that it is one alternative to building something even bigger than a birch planet. Those are limited in size by how big you could make one with Earth-like gravity on the surface without being inside a black hole. However, what people can survive, and what a big metallic shell or plate can survive, are very different things. Besides being able to take a much stronger blast at once, and in wavelengths that are harmful to us, a typical piece of metal with a very high melting point, like tungsten, can handle thousands of times the constant radiated power compared to a human or plant on a planetary surface. So a very very large metal dish or pusher plate, about 4 or 5 thousand AU out from the event, about a light month, should be able to withstand regular blasts of a supernova. Needless to say, this distance could be reduced with smaller explosions or with stronger materials. If you were detonating a typical supernova about once a week, you now have a massive engine producing billions, if not a trillion times the power of our own Sun. This is by definition a Kardashev 3 engine, 
not the usual Kardashev II style of engines we normally discuss here. You can use it to power an entire galactic civilization, or to move an entire galaxy. So far we've mostly been talking about the natural end of the Universe if our present understanding of things is correct, but it won't really end that way. We talk about how the stellar phase of the Universe is just starting and we're not even 1% of the way through the primary star forming phase of our galaxy, but in truth we're probably in the last 1% of it right now. We can never speak with certainty about mankind's future in space as there are just too many unknowns, but if we follow the general assumptions about colonization we've been discussing on the channel over the years we can make a very educated guess. In the next few centuries we'll start launching colony ships, not a few but millions of them, huge interstellar arcs that will race outward at a decent fraction of light speed to settle every star system in this galaxy and keep going till they bump into someone that says, stop, these places are ours. Be that in our own galaxy, or out at the edge of our supercluster billions of years from now. As the Universe ages there will be more and more worlds with potential for life and more and more time for them to kindle their own native civilizations. Odds are though we won't meet any in this galaxy, because if they were here we'd have encountered their colonists already, since at our current rate of technological progress we'll fill the galaxy in a blink of an eye, and we'd expect they would have too if they'd shown up first, so we're likely the first. Our descendants will not stop at merely terraforming a few Earth-like worlds around friendly suns, they'll colonize everything, possibly demolishing whole suns by star lifting to make either tailor-made stars or merely as feedstock for alternative habitats, organic or digital. Even if they don't tinker much with existing suns, they're unlikely to let new ones form if they're not as efficient as what they can cobble together. In this regard, all the stars of this galaxy are an endangered species, dying stars who count their lifetimes in mere millions of years, waiting for us to arrive and repurpose them. Most will probably be destined to either end as the center of a classic Dyson Swarm, or as the furnace in the basement of some mega-civilization, or simply disassembled, torn down to a small convective red dwarf or just basic building material. If you have controlled fusion, or can build Kugelblitz black holes, or cheaply transmute elements, or efficiently make antimatter, why bother using stars at all? You're still constrained by thermodynamics which puts limitations on how close you can mash a civilization together and effectively radiate waste heat so that it resembles a Dyson Swarm, but that doesn't mean you have to use a big, clumsy, and unwieldy natural star if you've got better options. Efficiency will matter to them since every bit of wasted energy is someone's life, if you're trying to stretch civilization out as big as it can go and for as long as it can go. Every star not contained, and every galaxy allowed to drift away, are potential civilizations that could have been. After the next million or so years of rapid galactic expansion, we're likely to see a period where folks begin shepherding their resources so they can keep going and prospering long after the natural stars of this Universe have burned out. In fact that last natural star burning out might find itself the toast of the party like at the restaurant of the end of the Universe, but not a going away party, rather a tribute to the dawn of a new civilization more prosperous than before, filled with artificial environments or simulated worlds based in ultra-cored computation. It's possible that the last star might not be seen for many trillions of years, or it may be just a few million years ahead of us, as we go about moving stars or extinguishing them and moving their disassembled components into closer, more useful configurations for a future galactic mega-civilization potentially composed of quintillions of simulated worlds and universes. I could see us making a big show of putting out that last star, a big celebration, a restaurant at the end of the Universe for those last physical engineers walking in the remnants of this old Universe as we shuffle off to new ones of our own creation, 
leaving the ebbing light of those last dying stars of a dark and expanding universe. As mentioned, a lot of the topics we covered quickly today are covered in other episodes on the channel, but we've never really discussed the full life cycles of stars that much, and even today we mostly focused on the implications of their old age to future civilizations. If you'd like to learn more about the life cycles of the stars, then try out Seven Ages of Starlight, a great documentary about the life and evolution of stars available on CuriosityStream, one of many excellent astronomy videos they have. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, and for our audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Isaac Arthur during the sign up process. Next week we'll be discussing how to move entire planets and even how to use them as massive interstellar spaceships or possibly even intergalactic ones, to colonize galaxies far outside our local group of galaxies. Lastly, we'll close out the month with our monthly livestream and Q&A, which will be on Sunday, March 31st at 4pm Eastern Time. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.